So today, we greatly appreciate you making time for this important social distance conversation, the first of four, and it's building off of our powerful gathering, Sue to Rising, a virtual protest in June. Many of you may have been with us. Um, it was an incredible convening of um, such a rich community. And in case you've missed it, it is on our website, sudoforsolidarity.org. Um, we gathered as a community towards transformative solidarity. And so we felt there was more conversations we needed to have within the Japanese American community and our broader base, our Sudo movement and our Sudo community. So this series will provide an opportunity for deeper conversations around identity and intergenerational trauma, anti-Black racism in our own community, and an exploration of what it means to be in solidarity with communities who have been historically and systematically targeted by racism and state violence in this country. This is the work. So we hope you'll join us for our second conversation. It'll be focused on policing and incarceration and is being coordinated by Carl Takei and Stan Shikuma and will happen in late August. So keep an eye out for that email. In terms of logistics um, on Zoom, so we all are learning all of these like Zoom, Zoom etiquette and details. We ask you to keep yourself muted so we're able to hear the speakers. So on your bottom left-hand corner, there's a little microphone if you wanna click that, that'll ensure you're on mute. And then we encourage you to share questions or comments in the chat box. So thanks again for making your introduction. It's really wonderful to see all of you, but please feel free to go ahead and put your questions and comments as they emerge and um, we will be collecting them and they will be discussed during the program. And the last thing is we'll be recording our speakers today. So if you don't wanna be in the recording, also on the bottom left-hand corner where your camera is, you can turn your camera off, um, but we wanted to be sure you knew that in terms of what you're comfortable with. So today's session is Japanese American Identity and Intergenerational Trauma. And we're really pleased to have with us Dr. Donna Nagata and Dr. Satsuki Ina and Brian Nia. Dr. Donna Nagata is a clinical science chair and the director of clinical training in the University of Michigan's Department of Psychology. Her research interests focus primarily on Asian American mental health. And the specific topics include Japanese Americans and the psychosocial consequences of the World War II incarceration and historical trauma, Asian American family processes, intergenerational relations, emotions, and distress. Dr. Nagata is embarking on a new project focusing on the Yonsei experience. Welcome, Dr. Nagata. Dr. Satsuki Ina was born in the Tule Lake Segregation Center, a maximum security concentration camp for Japanese Americans during World War II. She has a private psychotherapy practice in the Bay Area, specializing in the treatment of community trauma. She is a co-chair of Studio for Solidarity, as well as an activist, writer, and a filmmaker who has produced two award-winning documentaries, Children of the Camps and From a Silk Cocoon. Welcome, Dr. Ina, and she's also a dear friend. And Brian Nia will be our moderator today. He is a public historian specializing in Japanese American history. Currently, he is the content director for Densho and editor of the online Densho Encyclopedia. He's also held various positions with the UCLA Asian American Studies Center, the Japanese American National Museum, and the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii. Um, and lastly, I'd just like to say thank you for those of you who have put together this program today um, and put forward much of your time and talent to bring us here for this really important and meaningful conversation. And also following this session for those of you who signed up for our Healing Circles for Change, just to say thank you for making time for that this afternoon and to acknowledge all of the volunteer facilitators who've given their time so generously um, for our afternoon sessions. So we will go ahead and start with some opening remarks uh, by Dr. Nagata and Dr. Ina before Brian will lead us in a conversation. Again, welcome. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, appreciate being invited here to be a part of this conversation. Um, so I'm just going to take some time to um, say a little bit about the research that I did on intergenerational consequences um, between the Nisei and Sansei. To give you some background, in the late 1980s, I was interested in exploring how the World War II incarceration of second generation Nisei affected their third generation Sansei children born after the war. So I collected survey data from nearly 600 Sansei. This included 500 individuals who were um, 
excuse me, had at least one Nisei parent who was in a camp during the war. But I also ended up getting uh, data from another hundred Sansei for whom neither parent had been in camp. I also conducted in-depth interviews with over 40 Sansei. So in these few minutes, what I wanted to do is just highlight some of the findings from this research. These represent a broad range and of intergenerational impacts. So it's important to keep in mind that they do not typify all Sansei um, and not all Sansei experience these. At the obvious level, there was significant intergenerational economic loss because grandparents had lost everything while imprisoned. There was no inheritance or businesses to pass on to the Nisei and then following that to the Sansei as well. For some, a father's incarceration negatively affected his physical health, which in turn impacted the Sansei's life. In my study, there were 95 Sansei who reported the age at which their father had died. Of the fathers who had been in a camp, 41% had died before the age of 60, compared with 19% of the fathers who had not been in a camp. Other research by Gwendolyn Jensen has also reported that Nisei men who were incarcerated had greater risk for heart disease than those who were not in camp. So losing a Nisei father at an early age may be linked to the incarceration. My research identified important incarceration impacts in terms of how the Nisei parented their children. Though parents are naturally protective of their kids, but many Nisei were extra protective their incarceration experience, being uprooted from their homes, being put into camps for years, and treated as enemy aliens by their own country despite being US citizens, heightened parental concerns about ensuring their children's safety after the war. One key way that they tried to protect their Sansei children was to avoid talking about their incarceration experience. My research indicated that this silence was the most prominent Nisei communication about what happened. And by silence, what I mean is that the vast majority did not talk openly about what they had been through or how they felt about it. On average, surveyed Sansei, who at the time were uh, about an average of 32 years old, um, reported that they had had only about 10 conversations in their lifetime about the incarceration and that those conversations lasted an average of about 15 to 30 minutes. During these interactions, camp was rarely the central focus. Instead, when it occurred in a family conversation, the Nisei would often refer to it as a marker in time. Events were discussed as happening before camp or after camp. Other Japanese Americans were identified as someone they knew from camp without further elaboration. If the topic of incarceration came up, parents would avoid the topic altogether or communicated in brief, very cryptic or evasive ways. Sansei in my study described hearing only bits and pieces about families incarceration or learning it by, this is one of my favorites, through osmosis or through left-handed comments. For many Sansei, these communications created a sense of foreboding that camp was something too deep or painful that could not be talked about. One of my interviewees described it as feeling like it was a family secret, like a relative who is alcoholic and everyone knows about it but tiptoes around it. Another one said, it was like when someone is very sick, you know that you're not supposed to ask, what do they have? Sansei were curious and wanted to know more, but their parents conveyed a message that it was not something to be pursued. A consequence of the silence was a gap in the Sansei's personal history. Something significant was missing from their family past, and there was a distance between their parents and themselves around this important issue. So not talking about the incarceration was one protective strategy that the Nisei used. It allowed them to avoid dwelling on their past and negative experiences themselves, and it helped to spare their children, hopefully, from being burdened by hearing about what happened. A second protective strategy um, from my research that came up was how the Nisei parented their children. The Sansei were brought up to avoid bringing negative attention to themselves. Don't rock the boat was a common theme. And instead they urged the Sansei to achieve, do really well in school and be a credit to your family and community. Many Sansei parents also downplayed Japanese culture and language since those might re-raise anti-Japanese sentiments against their children. 
They raise their kids to blend in, acculturate to mainstream American society, be 200% American. As one Sanse respondent in my uh, research said, I think it affected them a lot the way they raised us very much non-Japanese. I think they encourage us to do everything so-called American, Ivy League, football. We didn't do judo. We didn't do kendo. We didn't do anything Japanese. One of my interviews even mentioned that their father avoided all Japanese products and would buy only American cars. The Sansei son then continued that buying pattern of cars in solidarity with his dad. As a result of these approaches, the Sansei often experienced a loss of identity and connection to their heritage, but also a sense of self-consciousness about their ethnicity that somehow being Japanese was not positive. One of the interviewees from my study conveyed this self-consciousness in the following way. He said, one memory I have is working with Asian immigrants. Every so often, we would all have these potluck dinners and everyone would sing songs from their native country. Someone would get a guitar or something and everyone would just belt out singing really loud songs about Korea or wherever. And whenever it came to me, and I think there was another Japanese American on the staff, we were just too embarrassed to sing, to sing anything, you know. We had no songs, for one. And then it was like this thing of being sort of embarrassed. Study results also indicated that Sansei who had a parent in camp were significantly less confident about their rights in the US than those who did not have an incarcerated parent. It was like a double bind, where Sansei had doubts about their Japanese-ness, but at the same time, doubts about their Americanness. Eventually, most Sansei learned about the incarceration on their own, usually through reading books, um, or if they had available to them taking an Asian American class. Sometimes they were able to get information by doing their US history paper in high school on the incarceration. Since the parent saw it as helping their child's achievement, they could then share more information. But as they learned more, Sansei also began to carry emotions of sadness and anger about what their families had endured. In part, such feelings could be linked to growing up with a parent who did not reach their full potential. For example, one of the participants in my study carried sadness knowing that his father could have been a fine artist and had the talent to do so, but after the war became a gardener. The Sansei stated that his father was never proud of being a gardener, and as a result, the family never talked about what he did for a living. In some cases, these emotions um, motivated the Sansei to complete their parents' lost dreams and aspirations by getting a degree, attending a particular university, or pursuing a career that their parent had missed. Others pursued law or community activism to help prevent future injustices. Interestingly, while more frequent communications with a parent about camp were associated with reduced experiences of family distance around the incarceration, they were also associated with higher levels of sadness and anger. So it seems that there may be some cost to greater communication. Sansei also carry what I called what if questions. What if the incarceration had never happened? How might my parents' lives and my life be different? So for example, what would it have been like if our family had not lost all that fam valuable farmland during the war? How much happier could my parent have been? It's important to also recognize that my research recovered, uncovered rather positive impacts as well for the Sansei. They see their parents as role models of resilience and endurance, and this has inspired them to achieve and push forward in their own lives beyond any need to prove themselves to others. Their links to the incarceration also helped the Sansei put their own struggles into context when they considered the challenges that their parents faced compared to their own lives. And for those who, uh, whose parents met in a camp, like myself, it's sobering to know that our very existence is linked to the incarceration. Silence, ironically, is a powerful transmitter of trauma. While the Nisei may have tried to shield their children from the burdens of knowing what happened, the absence of information actually piqued the interest of the Sansei. 
Avoidance of something significant signals unfinished business, and that has fueled many sadze to reconnect with their history. And as one last point to finish, I just wanted to mention um, a d one other point, and that is that at the beginning, um, I mentioned that in my survey, I uh, had participants who were both those who had a parent who was in camp, but also a group who had neither parent who was incarcerated. And because of this, I was able to compare responses from those two groups of Sanse. One takeaway finding was that while there was no, that there was no significant difference in the levels of interest between these two groups. In other words, Sanse did not need to have had a parent incarcerated to be interested in what had happened. And second, virtually all Sanse, regardless of whether they had a parent in camp or not, strongly agreed that they would actively resist a future incarceration if it were to happen again in the future. So taken together, I think these suggest that the incarceration trauma can have broad effects, not only for those who had parents who were directly affected, but also to a whole generation, regardless of a direct family connection or not. So thank you, that concludes my uh, comments. Thank you, Donna. Um, I just want to uh, thank everybody for being here and so delighted to have Dr. Nagata join us. Uh, I was actually one of the participants in her study many years ago, and uh, so wonderful to have you here, Donna, to share your findings with um, people who are very interested in the long-term consequences of the incarceration experience. Um, and uh, I, I also want to add that uh, Donna is one of the first uh, and probably only uh, psychologist who has gathered data so soon uh, about the incarceration experience of Japanese Americans. So she, she is really a pioneer in the field and uh, with deep gratitude, I, I wanna thank you, Donna, for the work that you did. Uh, so my part here, uh, the plan is, uh, Donna spoke for about 10 or 12 minutes. I'm gonna speak for about 10 or 12 minutes. And then uh, Brian is going to ask us questions uh, and um, then you'll go out into small breakout rooms to discuss uh, briefly um, your own responses to uh, our discussion. And then uh, you'll come back. We'll have some uh, open questions that Brian will uh, filter and ask us. And um, then the two hours will be over. You will have an hour break. And then those of you signed up for Healing Circles will be um, directed to the healing circles to discuss in more depth uh, your experience in response to our discussion. So I want to um, answer three questions that seem to come up pretty frequently in, in our discussions. One is a discussion uh, briefly about what is trauma? And secondly, what are the specific characteristics of confinement trauma? And then how is trauma passed on to the next generation? So um, what is trauma? And uh, one way to think about it is that the word trauma was not applied to our experience uh, for decades after, after we were released. Part of that is because there was a blackout on what the government did to us. And uh, there was an effort by the government to distort the reality of our experience, uh, euphemistic language, suppression of information, uh, and uh, warnings to the Japanese Americans when they were being released uh, to, uh, to continue their uh, survival in the US uh, to fit in as much as possible. Specifically told, not to gather in large groups and not to use Japanese language. So uh, both uh, the, the perpetrator, the victim, and the witness to the trauma uh, were silent. So it wasn't just Japanese Americans who were silent, it was the perpetrator who perpetrated the crime against us 
and the rest of America who were the witnesses to the trauma that was perpetrated against us. So trauma is defined as an experience outside the range of normal human experience. And uh, people cope with that experience in various ways, depending on uh, many personality factors, family uh, uh, values, personal style, uh, mental health. Um, but uh, not everybody became, had post-traumatic stress disorder from the experience, but everybody who was incarcerated was certainly impacted by it. So post-traumatic stress disorder is considered a mental illness that is in response to being overwhelmed by a trauma experience and um, the person's inability to continue to function normally as a result of it. And there were certainly uh, cases of mental illness during the camps. There were suicides, there, were, there was violence, there was domestic violence, there was substance abuse. <clears throat> um, all of that was rarely spoken about. Uh, but most of us survived. And those of you who are here who are descendants, uh, who know people uh, who were incarcerated, who were incarcerated yourself, um, know that most of the Japanese Americans survived the trauma. But what we haven't really talked about enough is how have we been impacted by that experience? So one way to think about it is to this very day, uh, under the COVID-19 pandemic, we're actually experiencing a trauma, a global trauma. This is an uh, inordinate experience of uh, a virus that has spread across our country. And we're all struggling to find ways to survive, to do our best. It is also a collective trauma, which is what happened to the Japanese Americans was, it wasn't just an individual incident or a single incident where maybe you had a car accident and, um, uh, and then after that felt uncomfortable going back to where uh, the accident occurred or uh, every time you saw a red car that you might have a flinch response or a flashback. Um, but what we're experiencing today and what we experienced during World War II is what we call chronic trauma. That is, every day we were confronted with the reality over and over again that we were powerless, that we were confined, that we had to live with the losses of our um, not just our material losses, but there were many invisible losses that have psychological consequences. Um, we lost, uh, my mother talked about losing face. Uh, that, that was the loss of dignity, the loss of our self-efficacy, our ability to decide and do what we choose to do. Uh, we lost our roles. Fathers who were in charge of the household uh, lost their power. Uh, we lost our future dreams, possibilities, because we didn't know uh, how long we were going to be detained. And um, indefinite detention is considered a form of torture. We lost opportunities for career and education. And also we lost our confidence in our government, confidence that we would be able to live out a good life and be safe. Uh, the lack of trust in our government, and uh, the hope of actually belonging as Americans to this country. Many losses that were so invisible that people couldn't name them. And because we weren't using the word trauma to understand what happened to us, uh, I think that contributed to the silence too. How do you explain something that uh, nobody else we certainly didn't learn about it in schools for us sanseis. Um, it was something to be forgotten, uh, compartmentalized. And in addition to that, I think uh, there's also the cultural um, value of uh, no monku, you know, no complaining. Don't whine about the past, move on to the future. And uh, there was the trauma effect where something so overwhelming uh, of a loss and uh, 
you know, such an indignity imposed on us. When you think about life in the camps, having to use latrines without doors and uh, having no privacy and losing uh, family time together at dinner, uh, the, the loss is so painful that people are prone to compartmentalize that, dream, that memory and actually forget. Uh, I, I have met with many clients who came to talk about their camp experience who wanted to talk because they didn't have any memory, although they were seven, eight, or nine years old. Uh, and that, that's a trauma effect, that it's so overwhelming that it's unbearable uh, to not only remember, to actually then repeat, to share with other people what happened. So it took time, and it's decades later now that we're able to talk about it uh, with more comfort and uh, uh, with more confidence. So um, collective chronic states of trauma uh, then stay with us in a way that the whole community continues to be traumatized uh, in a way that people don't label as trauma, but uh, our community was fractured as part of the trauma. Uh, the government set up these artificial standards, uh, moral standards that said, these were the good guys and these were the bad guys. These are the ones that could be released early and these are the ones that are gonna be confined even uh, more severely. And uh, as victims of chronic states of trauma, we're exposed to the perpetrator every day, you know, by all the limitations. And so, we are more sub subject to internalize the perpetrator story, the narrative about who we are, what we're entitled to, and what the truth is. And so we internalized, uh, and, and the fracture in our community continues today about who were the good guys and who were the bad guys, who were the ones that were so-called loyal, and who were the ones that were disloyal. And, and I want to really be clear that those are words that were imposed on us because we know from all the research that there were no disloyal people. There were no saboteurs or spies, fifth column activity. activity. No one of Japanese ancestry was ever charged or uh, convicted of uh, undermining the US government. So these are uh, um, the continuation of looking at how our community has been traumatized. And uh, something that we need to look at to heal and to repair. So that, that's my uh, description about what trauma is. Uh, the specific characteristics of confinement trauma. Um, so we had also uh, not just uh, arrested and imprisoned uh, and then let, lived for years in confinement trauma, uh, we were also victims of racism trauma. We were also victims of wartime trauma. So these layers and layers of anxiety producing uh, environment, um, besides the loss of privacy on everyday, uh, you know, personal care and family dynamics. So um, the specific characteristics are different from a single incident individual trauma in that there is this collective uh, story that is built around uh, what happened. And, um, you know, if, if you ever lived in Japantown like I did, uh, if we were walking around Japantown and we ran into somebody, introduce, my parents would introduce themselves and always the question would come up, well, what camp were you in? And, um, uh, it seemed like it was just a point of identification and no discussion beyond that. Uh, but if you said you were at Tuvi Lake, then the next question was always, oh, were you there before or after segregation? All those conversations were part of the internalized perpetrator, that we were using the dynamic, the frame of reference that the perpetrator imposed on us as a collective. Um, and then as a community, and, and maybe because, you know, when many of us came back to Japantowns eventually, others were dispersed throughout, throughout the Midwest. Um, but there were 
shared accommodations. We, as a community, accommodated to our, uh, our trauma experience. And we bought into the model minority myth that decades later, uh, we were, we were uh, people who pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps. And that was used uh, as a way of uh, separating us and also um, discrediting other minority groups who were still struggling in poverty. And we identified with that. And part of our survival as a community, because this was collective trauma, now this is collective survival, we had a uh, desire to have closer proximity to whiteness. That the more white we were, the more likely we would be safe. The more likely we would finally belong, that we would stop being the forever foreigner that um, we were granted a certain level of privilege and, and privilege even uh, enhanced by redress. The idea that um, uh, our, our experience was acknowledged and, and uh, the government apologized to us. But we continued after that to um, accommodate. And uh, Donna talked about the distancing the Sanses did uh, and the Niseis, uh, particularly distancing from Japanese culture. Uh, and um, this was a collective response. The more white we were, the more likely uh, we would be able to survive. My mother often worried that if we, if we didn't behave above and beyond, uh, that it's possible we could be re-imprisoned, that there would be a loss of freedom. Uh, so, so as a result, as a collective, we, we were hyper assimilated. Our outmarriage rate is off the charts. We were um, also, um, uh, lo we lost our language and we lost connection with much of our culture and traditions. And um, so the after effects of trauma then got passed on to the next generation of Yonsei. And, um, Many Yonsei today are asking, how has the incarceration trauma impacted me? What is it about me that is still tied to that uh, original trauma? And it's because we have continued the after effects and becoming more conscious of it and aware of it uh, is what our work at Sudu is all about, is to educate and um, undo those accommodationist strategies that served us for a while, but does not serve us uh, beyond today. Um, and then I'll just quickly say about how trauma is passed on to the next generation. So there are unconscious and conscious ways that um, a trauma is passed on. The unconscious ways are mostly, are very powerful because they're unspoken. So it's through the child's eyes, observation of the parents, uh, uh, their attitudes, values, their silence, their um, uh, signs of anxiety and depression that could be in the parent uh, that doesn't make sense. But the, the message of uh, still needing to succeed, of still needing uh, to be perfect, to be beyond reproach, um, so that if anybody commits a crime in our community, they are essentially cast out of our narrative. Uh, they are, uh, there's no community effort to, um, to support or organize uh, uh, on behalf of them. We've avoided mental health interventions uh, as a community. And um, there is, I think the, the most pressing, more common thing that we observed is anxiety. The anxiety shows up as the pressure on the next generation uh, to succeed in specific ways. And um, to the credit of the Yonsei, uh, and because they, they grew up with much more sense of privilege and entitlement, there, there is um, uh, many signs that we are being freed of the bondage of the continued trauma. Uh, 
younger people are speaking out. They are more broadly connected across cultures. Uh, many are themselves multiracial. Uh, and um, uh, so the, I want to talk about the multiracial issues uh, as we go forward. But um, also, I think that the conscious messages were, uh, you know, the rules, values, uh, requirements, pressure. Uh, you know, you will go to Yale or Princeton or Berkeley. Uh, and if you don't, somehow there's, there's an apologetic sense about not being able to do that. Uh, but more and more, we are seeing younger people who are doing alternative uh, careers. They are performers, singers, actors, uh, rappers, um, uh, artists, and writers. And in that way, I think there's a tremendous hope that we will eventually process by talking about it across generations, across communities, uh, in ways that um, bring to light what we have survived and uh, free up subsequent generations to be authentic people, to be absolutely who they were always meant to be. And I'll stop there. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, both Donna and Satsuki, for your uh, you know, fascinating and provocative uh, presentations. It's, it's a great honor to be a part of this. Um, I've been aware of your work, read your work, or viewed in some cases, um, and it's been very influential uh, for me. And I appreciate it on an academic intellectual level on the one hand, but also there's just such a familiarity to it, as Asan say, you know, some of the things you talk about with the American cars, yeah, check. Um, the, the emphasis on achievement, yeah, check. The avoidance of mental health intervention, okay, yeah. Uh, and just reading through the, you know, the group chat, I think our audience feels the same way. There's so many people saying, yes, yes, you know, I, I recognize that. So, and that itself is, is carries some, some value, so. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to um, ask, start maybe by asking both of you, because you both are also um, uh, have a familial history of incarceration, and just asking what drew you in initially to study this topic, maybe starting with Donna. You're muted, Donna. Got it. Okay, sorry. Um, absolutely. I, I think uh, growing up in a family where, you know, both my parents were in camp, I had observed this avoidance slash silence um, and it had struck me. Uh, when I would get together with extended family, I would sort of see the same kind of, you know, light conversation, but no one really getting into any depth about it. Um, so I do think that I had carried that forward with me, but it didn't have a shape or form. It was just sort of uh, an experience, if you will. Um, and it wasn't until I got to um, college and graduate school, I began to become more interested in ethnic minority issues. So I sort of pursued those, but you know, the main questions that I ended up pursuing were, were nowhere near um, moving forward at that point. By the time I got to graduate school, um, I was interested, but there was no one on the faculty who was going to be even remotely interested or able to mentor uh, exploring this. And there were very few psychologists in general in, um, who studied Asian American issues at the time. So it really was kind of a, a barren field right there. But I do think that the motivation came from personal experience and then it sparked the question of, is this just me? Is this uh, something that's a broader pattern? And so I took that forward in the work I ended up doing. And, yeah, it's Satsuki. I think it's uh, interesting, Donna, because um, I had a little bit of a similar path, which was uh, I was at UC Berkeley in the 60s and uh, outraged by the injustice uh, uh, against uh, the black community and uh, free speech. Um, but because we didn't have the understanding of the injustice that happened to the Japanese American, lack of education, no narrative to hang on to, um, I think that 
what you're describing of are interested in in uh, ethnic uh, studies or social justice generally, but I never in the beginning thought about myself as a victim of racism. Uh, I mean, I certainly was, but there was no, no container for that direction. So it was many years later that um, actually the thing that sparked my desire to uh, actually do some work around this uh, was uh, right after redress and uh, going to the Smithsonian to see the exhibit uh, that um, followed. It was about the Constitution and the story of the incarceration. First public experience I ever had. And when I walked in and saw this giant photo of my father in the Tule Lake Jail, I was so struck uh, by, it's, it was this weird experience of so happy to see him and so sad uh, about seeing him with his face bruised inside this jail. And um, so that was the beginning where I thought, oh, there's so little I know about my family. And I began to ask all my other peers in Japantown, you know, what happened to your family? And so we started uh, having these conversations. And then I began these children of the camps uh, gatherings on the weekends, just to try and understand nothing, nothing scholarly or academic, but just wanted to know who else doesn't know anything. And, and what was possible was through our, our tidbits, our little uh, scraps of information, we were able to weave together something that was coherent. And I thought that that was powerful and important. Yeah, and I, I wanted to, I mentioned it uh, in private, but yeah, Children of the Camps was just really impactful for me. And I was in Hawaii at the time and, you know, with a population that was largely not incarcerated, although there were people who were, um, and even there, you know, it resonated somehow. Um, so, but I want to just follow up with that on, you know, um, if you could talk a little bit about what, um, you know, the experience or process of doing this type of research was like, um, and, you know, how it evolved maybe over time. You want, do you want me to start? Or? Yeah, maybe Donna. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I guess if I had to sum it up in one word when I started it, it would be scary. Um, maybe it's maybe it's the legacy of the anxiety from my parents passed on in this new form. But um, I, you know, I had this research question, but it seemed very intimidating to pursue something that had been so under wraps um, in the community and in my family as well. So I was embarking on something to push and uncover something that was really um, not discussed, right? So that created a lot of anxiety. Um, the other part of it is as a Sansei who was born after the war, um, and I did not live through incarceration, I had the sense that this was not my place to dig around in matters that um, I had not experienced myself. So that added um, to the anxiety as well. And I wanted to be respectful of Issei, Nisei, and Sansei who uh, had chosen not to engage in this, right? So there's this other piece to it that if I dig around, I might be pushing back on, on that. So um, that was something I think that was uh, really impacted me. I, I persisted though. I, um, obviously, I, I went on to do the research and um, I actually went after that to study um, Nisei as well in a, with a Nisei project. But I have to say an interesting anecdote about the evolution is not just mine, but also how my family interacted with me studying the topic because, you know, like most of the um, Sansei family, I found that things were pretty um, not, you know, were avoided and not discussed. But as I started pursuing this as an academic, um, you know, my dad would say, oh, how's that project going? <laughs> Very understated, um, but you say, oh, I see, and then that would be it. And so, you know, it was still, it was this little sign that I think it was opening things up a bit. Uh, I was able to do more in-depth interviews with both of my parents uh, as I dug more into this topic. So that was really rewarding. The last piece is that it's a, an evolution, right? So um, I have this anecdote, which it, to me still is striking, because um, Satsuki, you were talking about with your dad and, and this convergence of seeing his photo in the Smithsonian. I had a sort of interesting parallel experience where 
um, I had moved to Michigan and um, we were here maybe a year or so. And my folks decided they would come visit where our new place was. And uh, after they arrived, my dad said, so um, you're working at the university. What building are you working in? And I thought that was a very odd question. <laughs> what building am I working in? So he said, yeah, what's the name of the building? And um, I told him the name it's, at the time was in East Quad. And he started to laugh. Um, so I said, I don't understand. And then he explained to me, and this was new information to me. So I'm now, you know, years later, um, having done this research for quite a while, he said, oh, well, I went from camp, one-way ticket on the train to Ann Arbor, Michigan. And my job was to work as a pot washer in the basement of East Quad. Yeah, so oh. it was, I was just the first time I'd heard this and I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, at the time, East Quad was a, a residence hall, a dorm, and it'd been converted to house uh, naval recruits because the war was still going on. And so he had gone straight out of camp and his job was washing pots in the bottom of East Quad. So um, just again, another way in which that just makes me feel that this is faded in some ways, the um, kind of the motivation to do this work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know what, when you talked about the reaction in your family, it reminded me of something that happened to me and I think a lot of other people I know is that uh, one way that Nisei will talk about this is it's, if it's for school, um, you know, where it's like, you know, yeah, it's, it's for a project, you know, if I, it, it will be a good paper and then, then they talk about it, but it's, you know, in the context of, you know, your achievement or, or whatever. So that, that just kind of reminded me of that. But anyway, um, back to Satsuki. So um, we thought about, um, when we made the film Children of the Camps, um, because I had been doing these groups after that whole experience of seeing my father's photo and just getting friends together to talk about their experience, people started calling me and asking me, uh, San Jose Buddhist Church, we have a group of 10 people, uh, would you facilitate and help us do a similar thing? It was all by word of mouth and never intended. Uh, and then eventually, um, a, uh, he's a scholar and a, a colleague said, you know, you need to make a documentary film about this. And I said, oh, right, now we're going to make this really public. Um, and then I thought, okay, well, I'll make one for my class because I'm teaching and this will be really important talk about racism. And uh, so um, we got funds from the California Endowment as a mental health intervention. Uh, and uh, this was completely... I thought was just going to be a way to get money so I could use it as an educational tool. But, uh, and then that, f those six people that were in that film were people I had never known before, uh, but I met them, felt like they had enough ego strength to be in a film and we didn't write a script. We didn't know what was gonna happen. I didn't even know their stories. Uh, so it unfolded just like every other children of the camps group that I had done. Um, so uh, then to carry through with the funding, we had to do these screenings in the communities. And um, uh, I remember one at a Buddhist church because we were supposed to then take this. And I thought if people saw the film, they could identify. And we, we uh, promoted the film as an educational experience because we knew if we said, this is better for your mental health, nobody would show up. So. Um, this man uh, came up to me while we were setting up one day and he said, you know, why are you bringing up the past? Why are you, you know, what is the purpose of this? Cause this is, it's really, you really shouldn't be doing this. And I said, well, why are you here? And he said, oh, my wife made me come. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, okay, well, let's talk about it after the film's over and then um, let me see what you think about it. And so then uh, after the film, and we leave the lights dark for a while and then the lights were on. And I saw that man, Nisei man, over there buying like six copies of the video and going out the back door. And I chased after him and I said, why, uh, wait, I thought we were gonna have this conversation. And he had obviously been crying. And he said, uh, that man's story, the one that got angry is my story. 
but I can't tell my children. So I bought one of these videos for each one of my kids. So that was like a classic example of uh, having that story opened up, permission to have the emotions, but still the inability to speak directly with the next generation. And so then I knew that we had to continue down that path. And I was, I was so struck by how, you know, how, how vulnerable uh, the people who took part in that allowed themselves to be. And that was just such a, you know, you just didn't see that from Japanese Americans. That was, that was the power of that, of that uh, video. So um, I want to go back to Donna though, but for one thing, I don't, I don't want to lose this. Uh, we had a couple questions regarding this in the, in the comment on her future or ongoing work on the Yonsei. And I wondered if, um, uh, if you could elaborate a bit on that. Sure. Um, so I am in the sort of hopefully final stages of putting together a um, study that will be online. And um, it's directed towards understanding Yonsei's perceptions of the incarceration, um, kind of how they place that in their lives, um, how they view it. And um, one of the goals in sort of extending the work I've been doing, obviously, is looking at the intergenerational impacts of um, having had a grandparent in the camps during the war. So this would be the next generation. But um, also because the Yonsei are so diverse, um, I'm, you know, hoping that Yonsei who don't have that direct connection this kind of connects to that last point I made when I was making my comments that you don't have to have a direct connection to have this be important in your life. Um, that hopefully Yonsei will participate as well, you don't necessarily have uh, had a grandparent. And the goal again is to sort of look and see where is this placed in their lives for this current generation. Um, how do they view uh, their beliefs about justice? Um, there'll be other questions um, sort of more generally psychologically framed, but um, my goal is to get this launched <laughs> hopefully soon, but it's, everything's been put back because of uh, COVID and so forth. But that's what the uh, study will be looking at. So, yeah, And then a number of people you know, have, have asked in the comments, how can I be involved in this? Uh, is that yeah, yeah. I mean, one, so that, that they, if they shoot me an email, um, you know, nagata at umich.edu, I'll try and generate a list. So when we have a link available, I can distribute it. Um, so feel free to contact me. Okay, great. Um, and um, let's see, Sorry, I lost my, um, I don't know how much more time we have, but um, Bef again, before we before we lose this, I know uh, later on um, we're going to do something with the healing circles, and I just wanted to, uh, before we get there, to have Satsuki maybe talk about that a little bit, where that comes from, and you know, uh, maybe describing that a little bit more, since that's going to be part of the program later on. Sure. Um, so healing circles. Uh, I think for me started with the children of the camps process there was something about the wholeness of a circle of people bringing their fractured stories together uh, that there is uh, some powerful healing that happens when you know that you're not the only one and um, uh, and understanding that the the impact and the issue is not our frailties or our inadequacy or our uh, trauma, uh, but the problem rests in looking at making changes regarding the perpetration of this kind of injustice. So um, Sudu for Solidarity uh, is a direct action organization. So we go out and we protest, we show up, we bring our paper cranes to represent uh, uh, peace and uh, solidarity. And um, we uh, bring the taiko drums so that we bring our cultural values and it represents the pounding, the beating of our hearts uh, for uh, our demand for social justice. So afterwards, we, because we've been working in coalition with all these other communities, we found that it was very powerful for us after these actions to sit together in a circle again. Uh, not just talking with other JAs in our community, 
but talking across community. <clears throat> and um, what we found was this bond that occurred because we may know our own story to some extent, but we knew our stories more deeply when we heard stories of other communities and, and the, the mirroring, the reflecting back, uh, the, the, uh, the survival from uh, the injustice uh, was so powerful. So um, healing circles is to heal the fracture in our community and an opportunity for people to sit together. So uh, today the action is our conversation that we have now and people will be able to have a break and then uh, right now they'll have a break and have a few minutes to talk to each other. But after the healing circle, um, after our uh, discussion is over, <clears throat> they'll get a lunch break or a coffee break and come back and be in a circle with 10 people facilitated by trained facilitators so that they can process uh, and hear each other's stories. So the focus there is to share your story and to listen with empathy. Okay, and then that's, that's uh, yeah, after the after lunch break uh, with this program, after this program, right? So um, we just have a, couple more minutes for this segment and there are some great questions that are coming from from the audience so um and we're going to have another period of q and a's a little bit later um but i just want to maybe close this part of the of the conversation with um and th this is kind of to draw a link with kind of the maybe overarching theme of sudo and and the series of programs and that's a question on whether and to what extent, if any, our community's incarceration experience and the after effects of it that, that you both talked about have maybe affected our community's attitudes towards other groups who have been targeted by racism or state violence uh, and or our, our experience with, you know, the movement for Black Lives today even. So, shall I start? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. So, you know, I think, um, I think we're being challenged today as a community to really examine uh, not just our history, but the broader history of, of uh, U.S. historical repetition of uh, use of mass incarceration, mass removal for communities since the beginning of time in, in the U.S. And, um, uh, but for Japanese Americans after the war, our, our survival was to increase our proximity to whiteness. That is, the more we were like the mainstream community, the more likely we would finally be accepted and belong. And in doing that, we uh, s separated ourselves and, uh, from other communities that were struggling. <coughs> I don't mean every single person but I think collectively. And even in my own family, uh, my parents uh, you know, used to denigrate black people as a way of explaining why I should be a better person, why I should strive more, why I should make sure I finish college and do all that, because you don't want to be like them. And that, that um, uh, message, I think, was pretty general. It was a survival. Uh, uh, message, but it led to this uh, fear that the privilege we had gained uh, was to be kept to ourselves. And uh, so our hope is to, for, for Tsudu, for solidarity especially, is to uh, be facilitators in moving away from that survival mode to looking at the broader picture, to using our story as a way to leverage other community stories and also to serve as supports and to be the witness and the uh, advocates that we didn't have when, when we were being victimized. So I think um, our, this whole series is to help uh, the Japanese American community and others to move towards this realization that it's only when we work together across communities that we're gonna have the strength and the, the power in unity to really make deep social change. Uh, did you want to add anything, Donna, or? Uh, no, I mean, Satsuki okay. said it very yeah. well. Okay, okay. 
So I think at this point, um, uh, we're going to end this part of the, of the program and um, go next into uh, breakout rooms. And I think this is a process that will happen for, for everyone automatically. So we'll split into breakout rooms for you to have a chance to talk with a small group. Um, and um, you know, once there, uh, take a moment to share your name and where you live. And um, maybe as a, as a focus of the discussion, uh, maybe start with what is one thing that you learned from this conversation? And then what is one thing you would still like to learn more about? Um, after about 20 minutes, we'll come back into the large setting and we'll hear from a few groups. Uh, and then afterwards, we'll have uh, a time for uh, additional Q&A with, uh, with uh, Donna and Satsuki. There's some, as I mentioned, some great questions that have come in from chat. So we'll, we'll address them at that point. So, okay, I guess um, we're back. So, um, so we have a few minutes now to um, hear back from two or three groups. So we'll, we'll ask people either to raise your hand physically or use the raise your hand in the chat feature. And um, I'll, I will call on uh, whoever I spot first. Um, let's see. Anyone? Roji has his Roji hand up. Roji has his okay. hand up. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah go ahead. Sorry. I, we, we kind of uh, brought the subject about um, discrimination by Japanese Americans against other people of color. And just, you know, uh, this is in reference to Black Lives Matter. And I've got a little pushback from colleagues who say, well, why are you involved with that? Why are you supporting them? That's, that's their business, not our business. So we kind of went into that um, topic and um, explored how this inherited prejudice comes from, well, I've talked about my uncle who was a bigot, you know, and just, he would have been good friends with Archie Bunker. But, uh, you know, where that comes from, and he said, well, you know, his white colleagues that he worked with convinced him that it was important to denigrate people that were less than white. And then the uncle said, well, what am I supposed to be? And they told him that you should try to be more white. So this is my niece and uncle, right? But it's, it's, it's a subject that I think it's, well, some people are uncomfortable about talking about, you know, I mean, they, they talk about, um, you know, being good to others and this, that, but inherently there's sometimes deep inside there are these prejudices. So that's what we talked about in our group. Thank you. Um, and then I should also add, if we're not able to hear from your group, um, yep, please feel free to add um, any comments in the chat. So, uh, but anyone else um, would like to talk about what their group mm -hmm. talked about? Keep your hand up because I can, I have to scroll through these screens here. Um, Hi, Brian. I just want to take this moment when people aren't talking to thank uh, you for being the moderator and letting everybody know how lucky we are to have Satsuki and uh, Donna speak to us today because they are really the giants in opening up the whole possibility for the Japanese American community to talk about how this affected us and uh, from, from me as a second generation person to the fourth and fifth generations in terms of really being able to talk about and understand what happened to us. As everybody has said all along, the, the, the modus operandi for so many years was to keep it quiet, to not talk about it and yeah. to avoid it. So thank you, and we're really so glad and lucky to have Satsuki and Donna and all the work that they've yeah. done. Thank you. Thank you. And then I, I have to acknowledge that was Amy Mass, who is a, herself a pioneering figure in this field. And I think, you know, we all owe a, a great debt to her as well. So thank you, Amy. Yes, thank um, you, Amy, for your work. Yeah. Um, I see a hand up from uh, Nathan. Go ahead. Sure. Um, first, I'd like to thank 
all the speakers because this was a wonderful conversation. Um, I'm actually Sansei. My grandmother came um, to the United States from Japan um, after World War II, so I don't have a history of um, incarceration in my family. But one thing that our group talked about, I think, is the relationship between the war crimes that the U.S. government perpetrated against Japanese Americans here in the U.S. through incarceration and concentration camps and the war crimes that the U.S. committed against Japan during World War II as well. Um, you know, the dropping of atomic bombs, the firebombing of Tokyo, attacking civilians. And so I think that there's, when you talk about trauma, there's a connection there between the trauma that people in Japan experienced, you know, and the devastation of the war there um, committed by Americans, and then the kinds of atrocities that um, Japanese Americans faced in the U.S. and sort of the intergenerational trauma that continues to exist. The second thing that was really, really cool that we talked about was sort of um, the intersection between a lot of these different struggles among communities of color today in the U.S. and why we need to be in solidarity with them. And I think one of the things that ties all of these struggles that we're seeing, especially with Black Lives Matter today, is this idea of the perpetual foreigner and of this threat um, of foreignness, quote unquote, that um, the whitewashing of U.S. history as one that was um, uh, sort of predicated on the idea that the U.S. is a white country, which it's not because that erases the history of, of slavery and genocide that this country was built on, kind of keeps all of these minority groups on the edges, on the margins, on the peripheries, and allows for things like incarceration. And so at this moment now, when we're thinking about abolishing police and we're thinking about abolishing um, prisons, I think we also need to talk about abolishing detention centers and abolishing all forms of containment because containment is the strategy. It's sort of the way, the mode of governance in our country today and what we need to be talking about rather are infrastructures of care. So how can we, you know, combat poverty? How can we combat neoliberal austerity policies? How can we combat um, social precarity um, without resorting to confinement, containment, and this idea of the perpetual foreigner seen as a threat to the myth of the United States as a white country, you know, as opposed to a country, you know, that was built on again, you know, violence and settler colonialism. So that's why we need to be in solidarity with everyone else, and that's why we need to push for, you know, abolishing all forms of containment. Um, but yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. <laughs> that was long. Uh, <laughs> no, that was great, though. Thank you. Um, I see uh, Eo Hanabusa. Go ahead. Hi, um, sorry, uh, so my name is Eo, but don't worry, it's like, no, sorry. yeah, yeah, no worries, um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I was in a group with Claudia, Victoria, and Robin, and something that we talked about is one, um, you know, spaces like this are really important because not only do we, like, get to heal ourselves, it gives us the strength to really um, culture that inter um, community solidarity, like how, what, um, you know, Nathan said with like, you know, we really got to stand up for other people, you know, not just for our own communities. And another interesting thing that I think um, that we talked about that was um, sort of like really heartwarming is how, in a sense, we now have, or like, we now get to see some, I guess, what we could call is like intergenerational strength. And what I mean by that is like, for example, mm -hmm. um, you know, Victoria really resonated with how, um, like, Dr. Nagata couldn't really find um, things out there to really, like, have, you know, mentors for her ideas, and then, like, she, she was kind of, like, on her to really put it forward and, like, cut out this space, like, we are going to talk about mental health in the Asian American community, and, you know, me, I just graduated from undergrad, and I had, you know, the privilege and the experience of having mentors who were Asian American and they also were re really well versed in like conversations about like trauma and things like that so you know that was a part of my education which is something that I'm really grateful for and um, you know it's really empowering for me and um, Victoria also pointed out how like some of her film work was possible because she was able to stand on the shoulders of people who came before her and so for younger people like me we have like that strong foundation that was set by you know people who came before us and like established that these are necessary conversations that we need to have and so i think all of that is like really important and to recognize and also like be really grateful for as well so that was um the takeaway that we had from our breakout room 
Great, thank you. Uh, and we have maybe time for one more. Uh, and I see uh, Rabindra, go ahead. Hi, so I'm Rabindra. Um, I'm Shinyutsu, my dad came to Japantown in the 80s. Um, but uh, I was in a group with Jerry, John, Sean, Michael, and Franklin, and we talked a lot about um, the sort of the ways that this intergenerational trauma accrues within your life um, and within your domestic start. Um, when you get out on the street, uh, you pretend that everything is just fine and, and that accrues and it becomes stressful um, and it manifests itself both in uh, the way that you deal with your family, but also when you go out and um, this is the systemic world that you're in. Um, a lot of what we talked about was uh, the relationship between Japanese Americans and uh, the black community in San Francisco's Japantown and some of the challenges that uh, came with that. And then upon reflection, realizing how much of this is actually systemic violence. Um, we didn't quite use it in those, talk about it in those words, but that's more or less the, what I came away with. Um, and then it was interesting for me personally, it's interesting one thing that I keep going back to when we talk about BLM is this sort of idea that reinforcing this racial hierarchy what is almost like that we believe that to be our ticket to citizenship um when that's obviously not going to get us anywhere um but that's been the case with the model minority myth and for the past um you know 50 years or so more than 50 years um and uh we talked about how that sort of pressure to aspire to that model minority myth to try it uh, fit that stereotype, how that really ended up impacting a lot of people who um, both were related to the camps directly and indirectly. Thank you. Uh, wow, the great, great summary. Sounds like you had some great discussion. So yeah, great to see. Um, so we're gonna uh, spend the last few minutes of the, of the program uh, 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 with some questions and answers for uh, Donna and Satsuki. And, in the comments, there have been some really good questions. So um, if they are uh, back online, I'm gonna throw, throw a couple of the questions we've, we've received out. Um, so, so we'll start with one that I think a number of people have asked about, which was, uh, can either of you speak to the often invisible or unspoken domestic violence that occurred as a result of mass incarceration and the issues specific to emasculation of the male patriarch and how that may have contributed and how it internalized physical and psychological violence gets passed through generations in families. So is Satsuki there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, I, I don't see you on my, <laughs> my screen. Do you want to start or? Uh, no, it, it feels like that's maybe more clinical perhaps. So maybe you could begin. Sure. So, um, I think the, you know, uh, traditionally Japanese uh, culture is uh, very, um, very focused on masculinity and leadership. And uh, uh, so when the Issei were incarcerated and they were head of household, they, they lost their power. It, it was, probably one of the most degrading things that they couldn't control, they couldn't protect, they couldn't take care of their uh, families. So, um, and, and this is where we saw uh, incident, higher incidences of suicide in camp and uh, reported um, incidences of um, alcoholism and domestic violence. Now, there hasn't been a study that I've found where actual statistics have been collected. One, because a lot of that information has been suppressed and very difficult to access. Uh, but we did find some uh, what, what are called incident cards that were like file cards for uh, information on reported incidents. And um, I think the, that that followed afterwards in the stereotypes even after the war where uh, Asian men generally, but Japanese men specifically, um, in actual life, lost their status in terms of their own businesses, uh, their own self-efficacy, and were forced to take jobs um, that were uh, necessary, the janitorial jobs, gardening jobs, 
uh, jobs that um, uh, you know are clearly important work to do, but was not the, the career path that they had intended. And uh, I think that resulted in depression and um, withdrawal in many cases, clinically, that I, I met people with who had withdrawn from the family uh, and isolated and uh, led to some substance abuse uh, experiences. So, uh, I think that um, then there was also part of the racism directed towards uh, Japanese Americans uh, before, during, and even after the war uh, was to characterize Asian men as, uh, you know, vile, animal-like, um, you know, would uh, be uh, rapists uh, uh, targeting white women. Uh, they were the threat to the purity of the white race. Uh, all of those things combined. Uh, and also, I think uh, Japanese American men physically didn't fit the ideal model of the six foot ten muscle bound um, heroes that were advocated. So uh, it has been uh, an upward climb, I think, for Japanese American men to establish uh, not not white masculinity, but uh, Asian and specifically Japanese masculinity, and I think we're 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 doing that. We're moving in that direction, but it had had a terrible effect uh, because then it trickled down to how the fathers related to their children uh, and the messages they gave to their own sons. Thank you. Um, okay, another question from the group um, from multiracial Nikkei. How do you deal with feelings of, quote, not being Japanese American enough, unquote? What can we do to define an expansive idea of Nikkei identity that welcomes in and affirms multiracial experience? So either. I, I love that question. I'll, I'll just briefly say, and then I'll turn it over to Donna to, to speak more on it. But, um, you know, the question, who is a Japanese American today? Japanese Americans are everybody because of our, uh, you know, premature press to assimilate. Uh, there has been this consequence of multiracial uh, sansei, more yonsei, and will continue in that direction. And uh, it has brought a richness to who we are as Japanese Americans. And uh, I think in our last healing circles that we did in June, many multiracial Japanese Americans uh, spoke about how lonely they feel, about also the feeling of I'm not Japanese enough uh, and always feeling like somehow they're on the perimeter. Uh, but that that is by nature must change and, and we need to hear more from the multiracial children uh, and, and um, there's, there's a lot of complexity around this. There's a great article written by uh, Karen Suemoto um, that you can find. Uh, I think if you Google her, you'll be able to find it, but it's called Ethnic and Racial Identity in Multiracial Sansei, Intergenerational Effects of the World War II Mass Incarceration of Japanese Americans. And she talks about if you have a white parent and a Japanese American parent, uh, who dominates who the kid is going to be? Uh, what society, what social group do they select? What, uh, who, who is able to define what are the primary cultural values? And those are issues that, um, you know, young people need to be speaking out about what they want for themselves. Go ahead, Donna. Oh, sure. Um, I guess the one thing I would add is, um, I so appreciate how the Yonsei generation in some ways have a freer sort of platform and um, seem to be able to express more about what their concerns are. So I, I think that's just a, a really important development for Japanese Americans as a whole, sort of the voice that they bring. But the other thing is, I think the question about who is or what is Japanese American or enough um, in some ways, that harkens back to what the Nisei were struggling with, you know, during World War II. It's like, who defines who you are and um, what are the forces that are sort of impacting that self-definition as opposed to one that's being imposed from the outside? 
So I, I think it's sort of an old question in some ways that is manifesting in some newer ways today. Um, so I just thought I would kind of add that perspective. Great, Great. thank you. Um, okay, another question from the group. Um, how do you recommend we try to engage in this conversation across generations within our families? What, so I would say one of the things that I have found um, just from personal experience and through the research is opportunities to have conversation that um, have time and space to, to evolve, right? So it's not like a one question, one off, you're gonna get the whole story. Um, I think those kinds of complex histories are ones that sometimes do come in bits and pieces as has been the case uh, for Asante and Nisei. Um, but I think having opportunities where there's less pressure and kind of more openness so that the dialogue can um, take time and to maybe revisit it. So it may come in cycles. Yeah, one of the things we found uh, when we did Children of the Camps, I, I, I wrote a, a facilitator's handbook that goes, that you get when you get the film. Um, is because some of the secrecy or the un inability to talk about it is a defense mechanism and you don't want to rip the defense mechanism away from the person uh, so it requires a certain amount of sensitivity i think the angle of going in as a request for educational information has been very successful uh, but it's a, it has to open with a soft conversation uh, and an invitation for the speaker to share and if, if there's continued resistance, my, my advice is, you know, defense mechanism serves a purpose. Uh, and you might want to know the truth, but if that person is going to be hurt by it, there's a required sensitivity that's really important. I also found that when we do group conversations, people are more likely to hear the commonality and then open up more. Uh, it's, it's amazing what happens in these healing circles where people will say, this is the first time I've ever talked about this story because they've heard other people sharing their story and facilitators have been trained to start their self-disclosure at a very deep level to invite and evoke that level of response. Great, thank you. Um, and we have time for maybe one or two more. Um, so um, has there been research on incidents of alcoholism in families with JA incarceration history? I've seen three generations of alcoholism in my family of camp survivors and descendants. I'm not aware of a specific study directly looking at that, um, but in my research, I did come across an interesting study that was published, I think in the 60s, and um, it was comparing the rates of um, sort of severe alcoholism amongst Chinese Americans, Korean Americans, and Japanese Americans. And what struck me in the data was that the Japanese Americans were the highest and that it was also true for men and women. Um, so that's sort of the closest that I've gotten to it, but it does make me think about that link. Uh, yeah, I think for me it's more from clinical experience uh, with families where uh, alcoholism was in camp, uh, very significant, and it was one way a person could escape the trauma. And then uh, after camp, uh, there was a, just from, from clinical examples, um, uh, there was a peak in uh, sanse use of drugs. Uh, uh, and, and um, as a kind of popular culture, but also as a way of, you know, I think anxiety is painful and many of us suffered from anxiety and depression and the escape from that is some kind of substance and the use of, of alcohol was the most easily accessible for the older people. Yeah, my grandfather was, a, was an alcoholic and um, that, that started after camp. Yeah, we had uh, yeah a grandfather also, you know, uh, and and yeah, you hear these anec stories anecdotally so so often. So maybe the the we'll end with uh, with this. Um, 
um, how can we better understand and unpack our relationship to Japanese American history and, and trauma? By doing this. <laughs> I, I, think, I think we need to talk to each other. We need yes. to be with each other. And, you know, uh, and I think the easiest way is by Zoom. Because look at the people from across the country that are here today, and people particularly that aren't part, uh, don't live in a Japanese American community, uh, for us to gather this way. Uh, so Tsudu is gonna have three more of these conversations across the summer and into the fall. So keep your eye out for that. Um, and uh, our intent is to include uh, participants as much as possible. Uh, so that everyone not just is listening passively, but also gets to engage in the conversation. So uh, that's our hope. And um, I think healing, healing is when we let go of the secrets, when we can name things that have been unnamed. And uh, the way we do that is together. Uh, when, when people can nod their heads and say, yes, I know what you're talking about, or that's new to me. This is the kind of conversation that we have been first prohibited from, and then later on inhibited from having. So um, yeah, and, and I think if you can organize small groups for yourself to have these conversations, many people after our healing circles traded emails so that they could continue their conversations on their own. So I urge you to do that. I just, I just wanted to add that um, another way to do it is by you all have the internet now, which back in the day, for example, when I started my research didn't exist and um, people were really isolated. Um, but one thing about the connection part is even back in the day when I did my study, people wrote comments saying, thank you so much. So research is another way that you can connect with people. They'll say, thank you so much for studying this because I thought I was the only one. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that this was worthy of investigation. So for those of you who are thinking about moving into research areas, I think that's right for um, more people to jump in and do it. Um, the last point is making a pledge for, for uh, Densho. Um, Brian, of course, is, is directly involved in that as a huge repository of tremendous resources that you can connect with. And um, I just, over the past uh, six months or so, saw one of the videos, I think, that had a link on it for the orange story. Um, which is really powerful. Um, I was in tears <laughs> after watching it, but um, there's so many levels at which the resources there can connect um, with histories as well. So definitely check that out. Great, thank you so much. Um, we're about at the end, so I think we need to start wrapping up. So thank you so much, uh, Donna Nagata and Tatsuki Ina for taking part in this and sharing your knowledge and your research. It's been terrific. The conversations have been great the chats. Um, so I think we're going to close here. And I don't know if, if Joy or um, Lisa, if there are some uh, bookkeeping type things that you want to fill us in on, on what happens from here or Satsuki. I just want to say one thing yeah. is that um, there are some dire situations that are occurring right now regarding children being held in the detention facilities. Yeah. And uh, we have on our website uh, links where you could sign petitions. Um, the judge we were hoping were, was because of the pandemic that's spreading inside of these family detention facilities, all prisons actually, uh, uh, has refused to release the parents with the children. And uh, the parents are being asked uh, to sign documents that will force them to give up their parental rights to release the children, but not the parents. And um, it's so resonant of the um, loyalty questionnaire in that it was a double bind, no win, prison manipulated, you know, government manipulated way to, to divide families and fracture them. So if you will go to our website, sudoforsolidarity.org, you will see a place where you could sign a petition and share it out with everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Satsuki. And just to thank all of you for being with us and for our panel. I mean, I think these are the conversations we've all been desiring to have and just want to encourage all of you to stay connected um, and continue to, to, to build the movement for Zudu and just to thank all of you for being part of this really rich community.